Hey guys. Ooh. Okay. Yeah, now it's going to be better. Well, thanks a lot, Alexa, for the introduction. And uh, my introductory speech is completely unnecessary now, which is great. Uh, we can jump uh, straight into the content. Um, my name is Eugene. And uh, as you might have guessed, uh, I worked at Google uh, on the Swift for TensorFlow project. Uh, actually, I joined the company just uh, half a year ago in, uh, in February. And before that, I was doing a lot of Scala for about seven and a half years. First starting at EPFL, this is the university where Scala got invented. And uh, then moving on to Twitter. Arguably, Twitter has uh, the biggest uh, Scala code base in the world. Um, so if you, if you did Scala before, you may have heard of some of the projects that are mentioned here. Reasonable Scala compiler. That's a new compiler that's developed at Twitter. So my former colleague, Win, is here to represent that project. He's the champion of it. Uh, then there's Scala meta, Scala macros, so all sorts of interesting stuff that are related to compilers. And I love Swift with TensorFlow because uh, it's about it provides lots of opportunities to use compilers for the greater good, which is awesome. And now Alex is going to say a few words about himself. Oh, OK. Uh, hello. Uh, I'm Alex, and I work with uh, Eugene on the Swift for TensorFlow uh, project. And before that, I worked on many uh, compiler projects using accelerators, uh, XLA, uh, also a SQL analytics engine using GPUs. So plenty of stuff. Um, that's my GitHub handle, if you're curious. And uh, uh. All right, I'll take the mic again. Uh, so it's not just about the two of us. Uh, this project, uh, the Swift MLAR integration, it would not have happened without lots of our colleagues and uh, you know other folks outside Google. There was uh, lots of iteration on the design, and uh, we chatted with uh, the guys at Apple and the Swift team. Uh, we also talked to Fast AI, uh, Fast AI folks, uh, for instance, Jeremy Howard. So that's uh, actually contributions from a lot of people. And uh, thank you all, guys. And the, the hyperlink here, uh, we will share the slides later, it, uh, it goes to our design document, uh, to the credits section. And there's a lot of people mentioned there. All right. So uh, our title, which I guess we all forgotten because it was there on the screen for, uh, for so long, is uh, Swift a syntactic sugar for MLIR? Uh, I guess it's uh, pretty much clear what Swift is. It's the language that you use to write iOS apps, of course. Um, uh, but it turns out, after today, uh, I think you'll know that it's uh, capable of much, much more. But what's the syntactic sugar stuff and what's MLIR? Uh, that's what we will figure out in the next few minutes. So MLIR is something that's also developed at Google. Uh, it's called. Uh, uh, multi-level intermediate representation, but it actually is deabbreviated in multiple ways, including machine learning intermediate representation. And uh, it's a lot of things. It's, uh, it's a very unique project that encompasses a lot of things. And here are the three cool things that I can personally uh, recount about it. So first of all, it's, a, um, it's not just an IR, an intermediate representation. Uh, but it's, uh, it's a way to build ARs, uh, to build modular ARs. And uh, it is designed to be shared between multiple compilers. We will see examples shortly. Uh, additionally, it's also an infrastructure, an infrastructure that can be used by compilers to transform code or to do great error messages or lots of other interesting things. And finally, one of the main design goals of MLIR is to accommodate the explosion of hardware uh, that we've seen recently. Um, and I'm talking not just about the usual suspects, CPUs and GPUs, but also about various kinds of accelerators. Now, uh, to elaborate on those points, uh, so first of all, why do we need a common compiler AR? So we have LLVM, right? And that should be enough for everyone. Uh, or, you know, so people thought like 10 years ago. Um, so actually, if we uh, uh, recall the experience of uh, multiple compilers that use all of EMIR, uh, we see that many of them, uh, they need something in between all of EM and uh, ASTs of the underlying language. Uh, so in, in case of Swift, that's SIL. In case of uh, Rust, uh, uh, that's, uh, that's another representation. Julia has something like that. Uh, 
And uh, you know, this uh, face palm uh, emoji uh, that's inserted by Chris, uh, that, that means that he wishes that there was an intermediate AR uh, for Clang as well. And uh, you know, it turns out that for every language, it's, uh, it's useful to have something that uh, reflects some of its higher level features and not just jumps immediately into all of them. And the current situation is kind of fine, right? Because, you know, LLVM is clearly the industry standard now, uh, but the, what's, what's suboptimal there is that improvements in individual ARs for, you know, individual languages, they don't neatly propagate to each other. So let's say in SIL, they pay a lot of attention to error messages, and so the, their intermediate representation, it uh, keeps track of uh, source positions everywhere, even for things like, you know, literals. But, you know, how, uh, even if the Swift team uh, spent a lot of effort making this happen, it does not benefit other similar ARs. So I think we as an industry could use some reuse uh, in that sense. And it would be great if there was, you know, an overarching infrastructure that would allow to build uh, top-notch uh, compiler ARs. And uh, that's one of the goals of MLAR. Another thing, uh, speaking of compiler infrastructure, so I understand uh, this may have sounded a bit abstract when I put it that way, but so let's, uh, let's get into a concrete example uh, from the TensorFlow ecosystem. And this is something that, uh, you know, our org at Google is working on. Um, so in the TensorFlow ecosystem, there's, a, you know, a pretty solid intermediate representation uh, called the TF graph. And uh, you can do a lot of things with TF graphs, uh, including transformations. So Grappler, this is uh, one module that deals with that. But then when, when you have to, to compile TF graphs down to concrete hardware, this is where the fun happens, right? So all those arrows that go to the right, uh, they kind of show different uh, compilation pathways. So at the top we have XLA. Um, this is uh, an abbreviation for accelerated linear algebra. So that's that's a compiler uh, for, for TF graphs. And HLO, it's the uh, high level representation of XLA. And so they have their own mini ecosystem. And so it can go into, uh, to LVM, it can go to TPU IR. TPU is something called uh, tensor processing units. This is custom hardware that we're doing at Google, and so on and so forth. So that's, uh, that's one island. Another island at the very bottom, we have TF Lite, TensorFlow Lite. Uh, this is a you could say a subset of uh, TF that runs, uh, can run on mobile devices. And you know, it can interface with an API. That's, uh, that's the API for Android, machine learning with Android, and you know, others. And y you know, the common theme here is that each of those uh, islands, they have to solve the same, s similar problems, not the same, but similar. Let's say, how do you take a TF graph and then transform it to whatever representation that you have on your island. And if there's an error in transformation, for instance, some unsupported features, how do you report that in a sane way? So uh, I think it would be good if you did not just uh, you know, core dump, but you know, provided good error messages. So that's, that's the same thing uh, that we observed on the previous slide. Uh, how do we build compilers with all the uh, you know, state-of-the-art techniques without having to reinvent them again and again? And uh, the final point why I think MLAR is interesting is uh, hardware support. So, you know, we all know about CPUs, uh, we all know about GPUs, but actually uh, there's more and more demand and as a result more and more different accelerators uh, that also need to be programmed. And the picture uh, that is shown here is, uh, is a picture of something called a TPU pod. Uh, this is a bunch of uh, TPU accelerators, uh, something that, uh, that we do at Google, uh, connected together into a big thing that's very parallel and has super impressive uh, computational capability. So, you know, there's lots of computational power there. How do, how do you make use of it? Because, uh, you know, the, uh, the architecture of those TPUs, it's uh, very different from what CPUs can do. And, you know, we, we have several versions of uh, TPUs already, one, two, three. Uh, there are other accelerators that other companies develop. So how do we quickly spin up new compilers and uh, support new hardware? MLR provides some answer to that. 
to give an example, uh, here we, we're going to get acquainted with a hallmark feature of, of MLIR called dialects. So what's a dialect? Dialect is like a mini IR. Uh, and uh, thanks to MLIR, you can combine those dialects together in a single program. So here on the left, uh, we see a t uh, examples of operations from TF dialect. This tf.add, tf.conv2d. So that's, you know, operations available in TensorFlow. Uh, then we have XLA, uh, this uh, very cute logo. It has its own operations. Let's say broadcast, all to all, and, you know, lots of lots of stuff. These are not just a uh, uh, few operations in each. And finally, I mentioned TensorFlow Lite, and uh, here it is. So with MLIR, it becomes possible to define those operations in a modular fashion and then just putting them together in the same source program. And moreover, when I mentioned infrastructure, I mentioned transformations. So it, it's easy to express transformations that rewrite those operations uh, to each other, to the same dialect, or even to different dialects. So let's take uh, an example here. We start with uh, TF Einsam, which is a high-level uh, machine learning operation, uh, which kind of sugars into a combination of adds, matmools, and reshapes. And so this is, this is one of the loaderings that we can define. So if you see Einsam, just rewrite it, right? So that, uh, you know, lower, level, lower levels of our compiler don't have to deal with it at all. So that they, they only have to deal with more elementary operations. And then afterwards, you know, depending on, on the backend that you have, let's say you want to compile for TPUs. <clears throat> and for that, you need to, to use XLA. And so XLA has this... HLO uh, intermediate representation. So then you write a lowering from, from those ops to HLO matmul, and then XLA takes care of everything else. So that's, that's one compilation pathway. Let's say you want to compile exactly the same thing for mobile devices. So what do you do? You, you, you transform that to TF light matmul, this TFL thing. And finally, let's say you're you know, a prominent startup, uh, you develop your own custom hardware, and your chips, they can do einsums really, really well. And it's one of the main abstractions. You, you, you literally have this, uh, you know, instruction in your assembler. Then you don't care about any of that. And you provide the lowering directly from TF to your chip. And uh, this is so awesome. Here we've been talking about multiple universes that uh, have been existing in, kind, in a kind of isolated fashion uh, so far, right? But thanks to MLIR, we're able to express uh, transformations and lowerings in a modular fashion. And what's cool is that we don't have to, we don't have to specify this multiple times, like, you know, TF goes to HLO via this desugaring to simpler operations and then lowering to, to XLA and so on and so forth for other devices. You can say, okay, so this high level operation gets lowered to its elementary components, the thing in the cloud, and then those components get lowered further. So it's like a graph, you know, where you go from a high level code to progressively lower and lower level components. And I think this is pretty powerful and a great way to, to write compilers. So that's what I personally like about MLIR. And uh, since, as I alluded, it's, it's planned to target lots of devices, CPUs, GPUs, accelerators. So let's just, uh, let's just find a way to write this MLIR. And, uh, you know, be first uh, to make use of it because it promises to be a really good thing. So this is what this talk is about. Now let's see some code. That was um, a lot of uh, philosophical discussions, pretty pictures, but I love code. So let's just uh, see how it goes. So let's write some MLIR. This is a function. This, this is a real MLIR syntax <coughs> in uh, something called uh, standard dialect, uh, which, which is shown by the lack of prefixes here. So anyway, uh, we're going to write the matrix multiplication kernel in a bit of a, an unusual way, and we'll discuss why exactly later. So here we, we, have a, we see a signature of this uh, kernel, and uh, it involves uh, two inputs, arc0 and arc1, and an output, arc2. Uh, and so all of those uh, inputs and outputs, their matrices, right, uh, their type is a bit unusual. It says question mark multiplied by question mark, meaning that dimensions are unknown, but you might as well specify the dimensions in advance if you'd uh, like so. And then the uh, dialects that care about static shapes, uh, static sizes of matrices can apply some optimizations based on that. But not in our case, let's not go there right now. 
So anyway, we have matrices of arbitrary dimensions, and uh, you know the, the last thing uh, after x is uh, f32, which is basically uh, float. Uh, now let's see how the code looks like. Uh, so MLIR, just uh, just like many IRs uh, of uh, today, it uses SSA, something called uh, uh, static single assignment. So it's a special representation for code that makes it easy to do a certain class of optimizations, and you know, we won't go into details there. There are books written about that stuff. Uh, but let's, let's just focus on the feel of it, right? Uh, and so here we see that all operations, uh, they look roughly like something equals uh, some operation with possibly some arguments. Let's say, you know, percent zero equals dim of some arguments, arc zero and uh, zero. So what happens here, percent something is like a local variable. And uh, the special thing about static single assignment is that those variables are immutable. So basically, they are assigned only once. And if you need to mutate a variable, you just introduce another local variable you know, and, and use the old value. So that, 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 that comes in pretty handy, because uh, then you don't have this uh, nasty mutability, and many optimizations become easy. So that's, that's just uh, a convenient way uh, to write programs, a convenient way for compiler infrastructure. Uh, now MLR has types. This is something that was grayed out in the previous slides, but uh, here I want to kind of, you know, put it uh, prominently. So all operations are statically typed, and we can see results of those operations. So, you know, lineage range produces a range. Lineage view produces a bunch of stuff, and you know, uh, this is also very convenient for compiler transformations. Now speaking of dialects, let's see an example of how they show up in real MLIR code. Uh, so here on this slide, we have something called uh, affine dialect. So this affine.4, uh, this is, uh, uh, you know, from, from the prefix affine dot something, you can tell what, what the dialect is. And so what's it all about? It's about something called polyhedral optimizations. Uh, there's uh, tons of maths about that, tons of papers, and uh, basically the gist of it is that if you write your for loops maybe nested for loops in a certain way uh, with a certain constraints and then use the indices of those loops like i, j, and so on and so forth again in a certain way, then you can rehash your code, you can optimize your code in, uh, in a very powerful fashion. So let's say you write uh, a matrix multiplication kernel, uh, which is uh, you know, a bunch of nested for loops, and then thanks to polyhedral optimizations, you can actually take into account super fine-grained details of your hardware, let's say sizes of caches like L1, L2, L3 for your CPUs and lots of good stuff. That's very involved maths and, you know, it's, it's pretty hard to implement from scratch, uh, which is why it's great that, uh, you know, we can have a dialog that takes care of that for us. Uh, now, there's another dialog uh, which is uh, kind of hidden here. Uh, linear algebra dialect. It provides some primitives that uh, simplify operations uh, uh, with matrices, basically, and with tensors in general. Uh, so here, this linear algebra view, what it does, it uh, slices uh, the uh, um, the second and the third parameter of the uh, of the method, and it transforms matrix multiplication into a series of matrix by vet vector multiplications. That's not the most straightforward way to, to multiply matrices, the standard one would be just, you know, three nested loops, right? And then tile them in, in, in a certain way. But, you know, this will be useful for further examples. Okay, so here it is. Uh, th this was a, a quick introduction into MLIR, and let's see how we can write it in a productive fashion. So, you know, you might have guessed uh, that uh, being on the Swift for TensorFlow team, we write stuff in Swift. And you know that was a natural that was a natural candidate um, because you know to express this uh, simple thing that we've seen on the previous slide one for loop and a call of a function we had to spend uh, several uh, you know sc several screens of text so maybe that can be done simpler and uh, I think Swift is uh, very well suited uh, to this task um, and so here's why I think so. Um, in one of the, you know, one of our design documents of our project, you can see this uh, saying that uh, Swift is just a syntactic sugar for, for LLVM. This is basically a running joke that we have. And what this means is that, despite the fact that Swift has a lot of uh, high-level features, uh, they actually they are designed to be lowered down 
to low-level stuff, so basically to LLVM, which is pretty low-level in itself. And in that sense, what we'll be doing, mapping Swift onto MLIR, it's very much in the spirit of the language. So here's how uh, one could rewrite the example that we've just seen in Swift. Um, so I won't be going into syntactic details here because, you know, Swift looks like many curly brace uh, using languages. You know, one detail is that types go after colons, but uh, you know, that's, that's also pretty common for languages like, say, Scala. Um, and, you know, unlike in the wall of text uh, that, that we've seen on the previous slides, uh, we can actually figure out what the code was doing. Um, so as I said, uh, we, we create multiple views, the views of the entire first parameter, you know, then we slice the second parameter and uh, the, th the third one, the output, and finally represent uh, matrix multiplication as a sequence of matrix by vector multiplications. So it's all cool and, you know, we don't need to write all those types that we've seen on one of the slides because Swift also has type inference. And uh, yeah, this is the way how I personally would love to program a MLIR. Um, so let's make this happen, right? So let's go from here uh, to here. Now, how do we do that? One way to approach this would be to build the MLIR trans translation rules directly into the Swift compiler. So, you know, the Swift compiler already compiles stuff down to LLVM, so Let's just compile it to MLIR, why not? Uh, that would be kind of easy to implement, but on the other hand, uh, that would not be flexible enough. Um, when I was talking about the explosion of uh, various accelerator devices, uh, I was meaning it, there's lots of them, and uh, you know, people experiment with them constantly, and in general, ML research is a pretty, uh, a pretty active area of uh, development. So long story short, if we just hard code these translation rules, uh, what's adequate for today into the Swift compiler, then tomorrow we have some new paper, people come up with a new way to develop uh, you know, machine learning models, and we have to change the Swift compiler. And again and again and again, that would be annoying. So a common, common solution to that is uh, to allow programmers like library authors, let's say hardware vendors, to write these transformations themselves. And that's what this talk is gonna be about, metaprogramming. So here's a quote from Wikipedia, uh, which explains this big word, metaprogramming. Uh, it, it sounds fancy, but essentially this is about programs which manipulate other programs. So I don't know, if, uh, if you write a simple code generator where you put together strings and then uh, spit out a program in your favorite language with lots of boilerplate, like you know, in Java, in Scala, in Swift, in, in whatever, in Bash, you've written a metaprogram, so there's, there's nothing too fancy about it. Uh, but, you know, metaprogramming has, uh, has a big history, you know, perhaps uh, 60, 70 years, and there's lots of approaches to, to doing that stuff. In the design document that I mentioned before, so the Swift as Syntactic Sugar for MLIR, we posted that to, to our mailing list um, a few weeks ago. Um, we go through a few ways how we could approach this. So how do we metaprogram MLIR using Swift? And so as I mentioned, there's string manipulation. It's a crude way to do metaprogramming, but uh, it works. And uh, there's other stuff. Uh, I think uh, uh, it would take too much time to talk about all of those approaches today, so I'll be just talking about quasi-closed. And uh, let's just uh, jump straight into it. So quasi uh, they, uh, our current prototype of quasi quotes in Swift anyway, they're based on two abstractions, quoting and unquoting. And so we'll start with the first one. Uh, first of all, we introduce a new language feature called uh, pound quote. And uh, this is a new syntactic form, so this is not the function, this is a uh, you know, special syntax, which is kind of signified by this pound in front of quote. It can take any expression, any Swift expression, uh, uh, including lambda expressions like here. And by virtue of that, it can include basically whatever, for loops, local declarations, local functions, even local classes, like lots of stuff. And what happens after you do pound quote, uh, the compiler creates a representation of this code and saves it until runtime. So see, we, we define the variable called matmul, uh, which holds the body of this quote, and if we pretty print it at runtime, so this is like a REPL-like syntax uh, that I'll be employing in the slides. Then we will see the 
the representation of the code as I was referring to. And it's not just, you know, it's not like we took the uh, source code of the program and just copy pasted it here, because see, here we don't have any type annotations except for parameters. And here we have a bunch of type annotations. So we know that VA is a view, VB is a view, and so on and so forth. So clearly it was doing something. So let's just, uh, let's just inspect the structure of, of this mathmol thing. So there is this handy method called dot structure, which pretty prints, uh, you know, nested ASTs. And here we can see what it consists of, right? So uh, I said that this, we've been quoting a closure. So here we have a struct called closure. You know, closure has a bunch of parameters, a body, so on and so forth. So this is all hidden behind those ellipses. But, you know, the, the, the first part, the first parameter we can see here. So, you know, parameter nil, it's, uh, it's the, the, something that perhaps I, I will not talk about right now. But, you know, name, uh, it, it contains the name of the parameter plus, you know, some fun stuff. So first of all, you know, we have something called symbols. Every name, it has a symbol. And, uh, you know, basically every definition and every reference, it has a unique ID. And by comparing those, uh, uh, those unique IDs, you can tell whether something refers to something else. So Swift has uh, overloading. And uh, as a result, we really need that mechanism to take apart things like integer addition, floating point addition, tensor addition. So that's, uh, that's a fundamental thing that uh, people do in compilers. And so we implemented that in our representation as well. Also, all expressions, uh, they have types. So here it's kind of trivial. We specified this matrix thing, a matrix type explicitly in source code, but literally every expression, if I were to write one plus two plus three, we would know in excruciating detail that one is an integer and one plus two is also an integer and so on and so forth. Again, this may seem obvious for that contrived example, but when you write compiler transformations, you really need this information. Like what's the type of this thing? Uh, and again, this is a, uh, this is something that, that's useful in many compiler-related tasks, so that's part of our data model. Now uh, that we've seen quote, it's, it's a pretty simple functionality, right? So you can just say pound quote, you can provide any expression and the compiler will give it to you. And so you as a library author will then be able to do whatever you want with this expression. Translate to MLIR, pretty print it. Translate to a query to a database like link you in C sharp does. Sky's the limit, so that's uh, well, this is the gist of metaprogramming. You can do really whatever with, with your program. But, you know, let's, uh, let's talk about unquote. This is gonna be less obvious, but I hope uh, I'll be able to explain it properly. Um, so, I mentioned before that matmul is calling into another function, uh, matvec, right? Matrix by vector multiplication. Uh, we've kind of glossed over that aspect, uh, but if you think how we're gonna transform this, uh, this quoted code into MLIR, eventually we would need to know the body of MATVAC. It's not just enough to say, okay, this is some function called blah. We really need that body in order to emit executable code. And so here's how it will look like in, in our representation, in our current representation. So as I mentioned before, there's this name thing and it has unique IDs, so that's what we see for MATVAC. It's kind of useful to know that it's a function from view to view to view, blah, right? But where's the body? So it's, it's not here. And that's a problem. That's, um, I make it sound easy, but this is actually a fundamental design choice in metaprogramming systems. And how do, you, how do these things compose? Uh, because it's easy to quote code, just the stuff that you see, but how do you do this in a modular fashion? So this is something where a link you based approaches have some problems. So what do we do about this? And, you know, as I mentioned before, we have uh, 60 or 70 years of research uh, put into metaprogramming and, uh, you know, th there is an answer called unquoting. Uh, so there is another syntactic form that we introduced called pound unquote, and uh, it takes something that has been quoted before. So as you've seen uh, at the top of the slide, they actually introduced another definition. This let matvec equals quote, and then, after this thing has been quoted, we just put it back in, into, the, uh, into other quotes, thanks to this operator. And now when we inspect uh, what's going on in the structure of the result, 
we see that instead of just name, we have a special AST node called unquote. And apart from just the name, it also has the body of the thing that we've been quoting. So that's, that's what we needed. Does that mean that we never can pull like, external code, which is not quoted, like libraries, like I don't know. Right, uh, yeah, so the question was, does this mean that we need to unquote everything or otherwise we're doomed? Uh, well, in the current implementation, yes, uh, and there are ways to go to work around this, but we will not have time to go into that. So in this quote unquote scheme in the pure calculus, then yes. But on the other hand, hopefully it's not such a big deal because let, let's say you add two ints. You actually don't need to know how addition of two ints is implemented, right? It's, it's a primitive in your hardware most likely. So you just compare the IDs, like this stuff, right? You make sure that this is an addition of integers and you just emit your assembly instruction. So uh, yes, this is a problem. Yes, there's a solution, but it's not a huge deal. So if, uh, uh, if we go about this very shortly. Um, all right, so now we're done with quote unquote and uh, I'm done with my part of the presentation. I'm gonna hand the mic to yeah, Alex. Uh, I'm not sure I'm using this right, but go about it regardless. So I'm going to present our current state of lore into MLIR. It's very early work, so uh, there are some rough edges. And um, uh, Eugene just described the, the dialects of uh, MLIR. The standard dialect is a bit, uh, it's a bit interesting in the sense that it's an eclectic collection of operators. We are talking about splitting the dialect maybe in certain sub-dialects, but that's the current state of uh, things. It, it contains element-wise operations, it contains cast operations, it contains control flow, so it's, it's a big dialect. Um, but there are some good things about it. It uh, offers the granular memory access uh, which we need to translate certain structures in Swift. And it offers the things I've mentioned, the elementized operations, the control flow, which are necessary to uh, lower arbitrary Swift code. So uh, it doesn't offer the sophisticated loop optimizations based on uh, polyhedral techniques, but at least it's easy to uh, map low level kernels to it. And since we are just starting, uh, we picked uh, this target. And uh, it also has backends for CPUs and GPUs. So you can actually go all the way from high level Swift code to running on a, on a GPU uh, with the current infrastructure we built. So we picked this because it's always nice to, to have something which works and iterate upon it. So the translation uh, input uh, is the quasi-code quasi structure described by uh, Eugene earlier. And uh, the current focus is uh, on uh, GPUs and CPUs uh, following a CUDA-like model of execution. So if you're not familiar with it, CUDA means that you run the same computation on uh, a bunch of hardware threads and the result is the combination of all that work. So this is, uh, I, hope, I hope you can see the text. It's a kernel body for uh, implementing the average pool operation. So in machine learning, the average pool means you take a bunch of pixels in a window m which moves over a base and uh, you take the average. So you can see here that it's, it's fairly idiomatic Swift code. Um, we move with, uh, with the stride which is the thread count so that we can uh, achieve the parallelism on uh, GPUs. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, you can see the two outer loops, which, sorry, which iterate over the, the base, the out index Y and the out index X. And then there is two inner loops uh, for input index Y in begin window Y and window Y, and the, the one over X, which actually iterates over the the window we, over, we overlap. And within that window, we compute a sum by accumulating into the output, and then we just average uh, the, the values. We divide the sum by the size of the window. 
So this looks like a fairly natural Swift code. And uh, there are some quirks in how the Swift types map to, uh, to MLR types. So uh, to actually represent those uh, multi-dimensional arrays, we've introduced our own uh, type called TensorView. And if we actually need to accumulate into it or do other sorts of mutations, it's called mutable TensorView. Uh, and uh, also window size, window stride are, are obviously integers. And let's see how this goes to MLIR types. So this is Swift, the, the, th those are Swift uh, types. And uh, in MLIR, you can see that the, the tensor views, both the mutable and the unmutable tensor view, they are represented as nested memrefs. So memrefs in MLIR are those multidimensional memory buffers, uh, which can represent tensors. And uh, we also have to do this thing which people uh, using GPUs are probably familiar with, to actually wrap the, the integers, the window size, and the window stride in uh, memrefs uh, as well. Because kernels run in a different address space. So everything is basically, it cannot be an immediate. You cannot have a parameter which is an integer because that integer has to be allocated on the device, transferred, and then you can actually launch the kernel. So if you're curious, hey, why is this, why are those two integers memrefs of a single element? Uh, this is the answer. It's, it's how uh, uh, the hardware works, basically, when you're not in the same address space. And uh, the way you call it, it's, uh, it's very similar to an actual function. So I've abbreviated the definition of the kernel here. And you can see that we just call average pool 2D over uh, our input x with a size, a window size of two and a stride of two, and the results are uh, uh, written to, to output. Uh, so th the, the fact that we have an output parameter is also meant to map as, as simply as possible to, uh, to the GPU model or accelerator model in general where accelerators don't return an immediate. They actually deposit the results in some output buffer provided by the user. So at some point, we are probably going to sugar this to make it more convenient. But right now, uh, that's how it is. And uh, in terms of runtime support, um, translating to MLIR is not sufficient to actually run on a device. Uh, devices also need ways to, to actually read from memory and, uh, and uh, uh, just out of the results. So right now, we treat all those tensor views I've shown as built-ins. So those are magical types known to the emitter, and the emitter knows that those, that's how these types behaves, behave. They are multidimensional arrays. So basically, we've introduced those types to just squeeze, squeeze it past the type checker. And uh, uh, we actually implement this runtime. We are going to implement it for, for each device. And uh, the indexing functionality those uh, 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 views uh, implement, uh, it's, going, it's re implemented in the, in the emitter. So we actually emit code. Whenever we are, you access an element in the array, we emit some MLR code. Uh, the plan is, uh, of course, to grow this library support as needed by, uh, by the kernels we are going to discover uh, by adding more use cases. And uh, the challenge here is that we are going to find a clean way to hide the standard library from the low-level kernels. You don't want your low-level kernels to be able to use parts of the Swift runtime you'd have no hope of implementing uh, on a TPU, for example. So the accelerators pose this challenge that they're not complete machines in some sense. Each accelerator has to has certain demands, so we'll have to find a clean way to to specify the, the set of features for each accelerator and lower with uh, respect to that. In terms of future plans, uh, there is a lot of exciting uh, stuff ahead of us. I think the most obvious is that we want to expand the language support. Uh, it's nice to be able to write uh, some CUDA style kernels, low level kernels, but we actually want to use the full language. We don't want to write C in Swift. Uh, 
So the goal here is to be able to write modern Swift and translate that to, uh, to CUDA code, efficient CUDA code, and efficient TPU code, and so on and so forth. And tied into that is also we want this seamless and holistic interaction between the low-level parts of your code and the high-level parts. So you could have some high-level layers. You write with a very high-level Swift, and you could have some kernel. Uh, you write in a, in a more low-level fashion using a, a bunch of loops. And we want to be able to, I don't know, move loop invariants across multiple layers of abstraction. So having a single target uh, from the high-level high language, MLR with multiple dialects, will allow for that. And uh, a, a third direction, uh, which is particularly exciting with something uh, like Swift, which is a compiled language, is uh, ahead-of-time compilation. Uh, and I can think of many use cases for that. Uh, it's, it's great if you really care about deterministic behavior, so you want the performance to look a certain way all the time without warm-up issues, uh, without any sort of weirdness you're not aware of uh, when you're deploying the code. And also probably mobile devices could benefit from that. We know that Swift is fairly big in, uh, in the mobile space, so it would be interesting to, to really uh, see what's, what's there uh, in, by, by using a ahead of time compilation. So with this, I think, I think we're done. And uh, I suppose I, we could take questions. Yes. Almost a final representation. Yeah, so uh, it's not a final representation because you have to lower to the actual native code for the device, uh, obviously. Um, but there is also, it's, it's not just representation. Uh, you could represent pretty much anything with built ins. You just say, okay, I have this built in which allocates memory with this layout and uh, does whatever magic to it. So, sure, you could add that uh, in, a, in the dialect for. Let's say that you, you can introduce a dialect for a specific device, but then you actually have to implement it. So lowering to MLIR is half or less than half of the work. I think a lot, is going to, uh, a lot of work is going to be in implementing the, the supporting runtime for it. It's, it's the same for any language in general. You, you implement the compiler in half the time, and the other half is adding runtime support. Yeah, yes. Okay. So MLIR multi-level intermediate representations, but I didn't see anything that was multi-level. Uh, I think oh, you. I saw scripts and quotes and unquotes. All right. Yeah. Uh, so to repeat the question, uh, Win is asking about multiple levels, because we we've been working in Swift, right? Um, so I guess Alex wanted to comment on that. Well, I don't know where your slide is, but we actually had uh, uh, here, you can see that we have, we have linear, we, we have three dialects in this example. We have the fine dialect, we have the lineage uh, dialect, and we also have a bit of standard dialect, things like return. So here we already have three dialects. So the levels are the dialects? Uh, yes, uh, the, the, so a, a fine is, the most low level, well, not really. Uh, a fine is a fairly low level, but it also offers polyhedral uh, tricks. Um, so the lineage is the more macro dialect. So it has operations, big operations in it. So you can expect to, to find things like, oh, lineage view. View is a big operation if, if you need to do some reshapes. So it's more macro, whereas the standard dialect and the four dialect are more more granular. So that's the multi-level part uh, here. It's the dialects. Yeah, so the role of Swift here is that we can use uh, the same language to drive all of them, uh, supposedly. This is still you know, early days of the project. And additionally, Alex was uh, talking about transformations in MLIR, and uh, here I had a slide that said, you know, here are multiple dialects, different levels of abstraction, and you can, uh, can lower 
between one another. You can transform one into another. Uh, currently, this is uh, this transformation is going to be written in C++ in other ways. And uh, wouldn't it be cool to, to write those transformations also in a high-level language, which is Swift? And uh, wouldn't it be cool to uh, have a compiler toolchain that uses the same language for everything? Because currently, if we think about existing toolchains, let's take TensorFlow. There's a Python, a Python front end. Uh, there's a, there's a runtime written in C++. There's a compiler. There's also other stuff uh, that, that we've seen a bit earlier here. And so these are kind of different universes in themselves, usually written in different languages. So what if we could write all of that or you know, kind of embed all of that and consume over time into one high level language? I think that would be really awesome. So one of the themes, um, another uh, saying that we have in our project is this central theme of infinite hackability. So what if we could give uh, users you guys basically the power to modify every component in your tool chain. It's, it's not like you need it every day, but when you really need it, what do you do, right? So let's say you want to add a new operation to TensorFlow, you just go ahead and you know write it in C++, you register it in a bunch of places, and you know, not everyone knows C++, for instance. Yeah, and it's not just that not everyone knows C++, it's also the fact that if you write your extension in uh, the same language as the rest of the system. You don't have this barrier between, oh, the part which is actually a compiler and optimizes and this other thing, which I marshal some data over to and you know, I lose some, some performance. So this, this actually will make it possible to, to cross barriers between user extensions and whatever is in the compiler already and transparently optimize across that. At least that's, I think that's the, the aspiration. Yeah, so we just leaked the ultimate uh, plan of the project. Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's a, it's a pretty exciting thing. But, uh, you know, a, a good way to start is to start small, uh, which is why we're showing this, you know, weird things. How about we write all that stuff in Swift? And, you know, but this is all part of a big plan. Um, yeah, so the question was, uh, how do you add support for a new target? Uh, so do you have to support whatever dialects were there, or what do you do? Uh, there are multiple ways. And again, I'll move to the previous thing that we had. Uh, so, 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 so see, here we have multiple approaches, right? Uh, you can lower high-level operations into low-level ones and reuse that thing, uh, like HLO and the TF flight dialects uh, did. But also, if you know better, you can just rewrite it uh, yourself. So you have multiple options, that's the thing. And I guess, don't quote me on that, because you know, I'm not on the MLIR team, I'm, I'm just one of the users, right? And I guess the idea is that you really should be able to pick and choose. You just put together your own dialect, like see it says my chip dot something, right? If, if that suits you well, and you define translation rules. And you have lots of uh, opportunities how to do that. Yeah, there are plenty of opportunities to reuse here. So let's say you've implemented, so on your hardware, let's say you have some matrix multiplication, some reshape, you don't need to re-implement INSAM. <laughs> Speaking from experience, implementing ISAM is not fun. So if you can actually just take an implementation which already exists and maybe doesn't offer the peak performance, so maybe you can look at certain patterns later, later but at least you have a baseline. You, you actually have it in one place and you can reuse it as is. So. Yeah, that would be the idea. You lower as much as you need it. You use the passes, the mandatory optimizations you actually need. And uh, it, it, it speeds up the process considerably. Yeah, so instead of uh, writing an entire compiler from scratch, right, uh, you can reuse most of the stuff, like Alex said, let's say the lowering for Einsam or you know, whatever other hundreds of operations that uh, you might find useful in TF. Yeah. Yeah, you see this a bit with, uh, with XLA as well, where you just, with XLA you implement the backend for your target, but the high level transformations are actually already existing uh, in XLA. So if you implement a backend for XLA, you have TensorFlow working on your device. So that's a lot, a lot of the newer startup, chip startups do this. They, they implement a backend for, for XLA or for MLIR and they, they get something for free. So the, the approach is working. 
Yeah. <laughs> the weakest link in your chain is going to be the weakest dialect. In other words, if my chip is um, dialect not very good, well tested, the program is going to fail somewhere down the line. Um, and in large organizations, I feel that you're, you're putting things back onto the social um, control of this organization. And so, uh, <laughs> uh, I'm not. Point is, if you're going to build a dialect and you're going to make everything rely on it, damn well better test it. Yes, but you're not going to make everything rely on it. You're not going to make unre unrelated hardware rely on your dialect. So, okay, you've added a dialect with some operations for your hardware. So, it, only that would be fragile if you if you don't really test test it well. So. I assume that if someone wants to contribute some standard transformations, they are going to be reviewed you know, carefully, and people are going to notice really quickly if some loop invariant code motion is broken, because everything will break really quickly. So uh, yes, it's, it's just a matter of a, a, a fraction of uh, what people build are, is actually going to go back to the, to the standard parts of uh, MLIR. And then you're going to have their extensions, their, their transformations. And if those are brittle, I, I don't think it's making anything worse. Uh, trying to make the entire system end-to-end -end, uh, by yourself, it's going to be more brittle than sharing at least one part with a, with a bigger group of people. Yeah, I, I mean, this argument works for, OK, why, why shouldn't everyone silo their code and build their own thing and not step on each other's toes? I think there is the downside that you're going to re-implement some 11 times, and that's, that's not sustainable. Operating systems. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I, you, you can push this to, to, uh, to an extent. That we, we'll, we'll see exactly where the, where the line is drawn, because sometimes you have this situations where, okay, should this, should this really be in the, in the this uh, dialect for GPUs or would it sit better in the, in the standard dialect because it's more generally useful with a few changes? And you know, this is going to be, as always, how, how well it's done depends on the taste and the, uh, depends on the people who review, who make, make the decisions, and I, I trust them. I think, uh, <laughs> I think people involved are, are pretty capable of of uh, managing this well. All right, any other questions, guys? Yes, sir. Yeah, so uh, what's your ideal timeline for merging the quality codes and the other words <laughs> like control skills master? All right, uh, so to repeat the question, uh, what's the uh, ideal timeline for merging the stuff that we have in Swift and TensorFlow, including quasi codes into master? of uh, the Swift compiler, I presume, right? Uh, this uh, remains to be seen, something that uh, we talked about with Alexi before the meetup. Uh, so Swift the community has a robust uh, Swift evolution process, and it's community-driven. Um, it has uh, its shepherds, uh, the Swift evolution, the, the core Swift team. And, uh, you know, I think it would be really good to go through this process uh, you know, for, for this project. So we are part of the Swift community and uh, we respect the existing tradition. So how this will work, um, I understand this is kind of a weasel answer, right? But it's not intended to be one. Uh, once uh, certain parts of Swift TensorFlow mature, uh, we will be submitting Swift Evolution proposals. And funny that you ask, uh, just a few days ago, uh, we submitted an uh, automated differentiation proposal. And so afterwards, this thing is evaluated uh, like any other proposal, we get feedback from the core team, from the community, and if people think that's a good idea, that's going to get merged. Otherwise, well, back to the drawing board. 
Yeah, so to repeat the question, uh, uh, this is, uh, uh, th there are certain parallels between the uh, uh, AD proposal that's been submitted recently and this work. Basically both, if you just squint, uh, uh, they're both about metaprogramming, about transforming Swift programs into something else. So why do this differently? Why not come with a, some sort of a mega framework like compiler plugins for Swift compiler? Um, yeah, that's a great question, I agree. Uh, an immediate answer would be, uh, so quasi quotes they provide a, uh, the functionality that has much uh, smaller scope than what's necessary for AD. Uh, I cannot, uh, this, this is probably not, not the place to go into details of how AD is implemented, but it really enjoys the deep in integration with the Swift compiler. So with quasi quotes we just provide symbols and types and here you go, you cannot even modify anything. But AD, it needs to generate code and it, it needs to integrate into both the type checker and the uh, 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 parts of the compiler that work with SIL, the intermediate representation of the Swift compiler. So it's more overarching. Uh, I can perhaps speak uh, from my Scala experience. Uh, so in Scala, we tried to build this framework that would allow for a lot of power. And this is called Scala Reflect and then we moved on to Scala Meta. And so if there's one thing that I learned from that, you know, it's really hard to do this in a robust manner. So perhaps there are some of you in the room who wrote some Scala macros and uh, you guys can, can tell uh, what a joy this is. And so, so I think uh, uh, to sum it up, the TLDR answer is that sometimes it's really useful to have different systems for different things. And if we write one mega system, especially for metaprogramming, there is a risk that it'll be too powerful, meaning, you know, basically intractable or hard, hard to control. All right, another question. Please go ahead. Uh, maybe I'm just, what's, it, what's the status of the MLR, MLIR development process? And what is the status of the project? So I didn't get the second part of the question. I think MLIR follows a similar process of proposal. So there are open uh, in, uh, meetings for the MLR interest group. Uh, you should be able to attend any of those and submit proposals. So it's, there are many stakeholders. Uh, and uh, I, I didn't get the second part of the question. So if you could well, repeat that. Uh, I don't think if I'd call it 1.0, but the things mostly work. You can actually generate working code uh, for things I've shown to you, like the, the average, for, okay, we can actually generate code which runs. So we have tests which actually run. Um, it, I, I think uh, it's, it's not polished on all, on all architectures. CPUs are, and G, CPU and GPU are probably the fur, furthest along and the standard dialect of, uh, of all. Um, so that's probably not that far from a 1.0 release. But uh, yeah, I, I'm not even sure we're using versioning yet in MLR. I think it's... it's I guess uh, that would be a good question for the actual MLR team. Yeah. Uh, so as Alex said, uh, they hold open design meetings, uh, which is basically a Google Hangout. Anyone can join and uh, this stuff happens uh, every Thursday, 10 a.m. Pacific time. And this week it's canceled, I think, or not. Don't, don't take my word for it. There's, yeah, uh, there's a mailing up. list for MLAR and uh, they post their agenda. So perhaps Thursday, 10 a.m., you'd be able to ask a question. And uh, this is how it goes. There's a bunch of people who join and uh, they write their questions in the chat. And then people from the actual MLAR team go ahead and answer them. Um, there's also another part that you asked about uh, the balance between open source and proprietary parts. Uh, so clearly, let's say TPUs, they're partly closed, right? So there's an API to program them, but how they are built uh, and you know how the drivers look like, this is proprietary and uh, we, we cannot tell the world about that. Uh, however, you know, as we mentioned before, and th that's a good picture, right? Uh, MLR is designed to be modular, uh, so it's possible to have an open source core and then whatever hardware uh, producers can do whatever 
either open source or not, it doesn't matter. And you know, ultimately, when, when you want to, to lower your code uh, to something that can execute on your accelerator, you just plug in those modules and it works. And uh, if you decide not to publish those modules, well, it's only you who'd be able to do that. Yeah, and in general, what I've noticed is that people are biased towards putting as many transformations as possible in the higher layers of a system. So it's, it's, if something is not in the open source part, is because it probably wouldn't make sense for any other piece of hardware than the one a certain group of people have targeted. So it's, uh, it's as open as it actually makes sense, I'd say. Yeah, speaking of openness, by the way, uh, it's, it, it's a good day for this question because uh, just today our company decided to donate MLAR to the LLVM Foundation. And so uh, this, is a, this is a very cool day for us. And uh, our CEO, he actually tweeted about the project, which is completely amazing. Uh, let's, let's see how things go. OK, go ahead. All right, uh, to repeat the question, uh, do we have plans to implement macros for Swift? <laughs> yeah, I, I'd perhaps go back uh, to, to the thing about uh, powerful metaprogramming systems. And uh, unless that's absolutely necessary, perhaps no, and uh, concretely for this project, I think we can get away with quasi codes. If there are other use cases that arise and that are pertinent, uh, Perhaps uh, we can. I mean, I already did that once, so doing that the second time is uh, feasible. All right, another question. Yeah. Uh, so uh, there are some languages where in Scala you can express more things, like more precise types. For instance, for matrices, you can do like mentions. Would it be helpful, or just like Swift doesn't try to be like very Okay. Yeah, to, to recap the question, uh, uh, to what extent are we willing to go into the type level depths to provide static validation of uh, tensor programs? Or right. So, actually, there was some type level stuff already in the slides, but it was uh, really well masked. And uh, <laughs> let me just unmask it. So, this here, uh, right? Uh, so, here we see this, this average pool 2D, right? Uh, it's a quote. But on the other hand, you can call it as a function, and uh, it statically checks the arguments. So because uh, this, this quote, it says uh, that, you know, out is a mutable tensor view, view and, uh, uh, you know, input is a tensor view. If you pass, like, integers there, it will not compile. So Swift can do some type-level stuff, thanks to protocols. And uh, I think this is, uh, this is pretty good. More advanced things, like validating shapes of tensors, uh, that's, um, that's more advanced. Yeah, I think for something like that, you have to be really mindful of, uh, for example, dynamic batch size. So let's say you have a, a batch matrix multiplication, and sure, the batch can be dynamic, but the inner dimension of the first matrix has to be equal to the uh, outer dimension of the second matrix. So you'll basically need to introduce some type constraints if you want to go be third further and say, oh, okay, uh, those sizes are actually uh, constant, and this those other two dimensions have to match. So it's, it's, it's a scary path. I'm not saying we, we are never going to go that path, but yeah, it's, it's definitely tough. Yeah, there, there are, there, there, let's put it this way, there are proposal at MLR level, and we have to be careful what kind of boxes we open, uh, because some of them might contain I yeah, so things. as Alex said, it's, uh, it's actually possible to replace those question marks with uh, funny stuff. You can replace them with constants as of now. So that, that's something we can do. If you want to type statically everything, then yeah, that's something you probably could add even at the higher layers. But then people complain all the time that, oh, well, now, I, now I'm going to have to recompile my program with a different batch size, and this is silly. And yeah, uh, okay. <laughs> I, I'm, not, I'm not much of a front-end uh, of the language person, so I think uh, Eugene is probably the, the right person to say whether this is positively scary or 
some other yeah, reason. Yeah, I'll say the boring thing that I was saying about metaprogramming. Uh, it would be good to think about usability aspects first. Uh, yeah. Like what kind of error messages are we going to show to the, the users? So uh, Scala, in Scala, it was very, not very easy, but feasible to do all of that. But error messages, they were kind of suboptimal. So it was possible to say, okay, here's a matrix multiplication function. You can only multiply matrices uh, whose dimensions line up. Uh, but yeah, how, how do you do good error messages? Uh, also, that, that's one thing. Another thing, uh, now if you require matrices to specify their dimensions statically or as type parameters, uh, if you don't know about them, how do you write functions where you don't care about dimensions? Well, you cannot, right? You have to specify them everywhere. Uh, which is annoying in its own right. Uh, so there are open questions, and I think it would be good to find answers to them before we do that. All right, another question. Nice. <laughs> do I miss Scala? Uh, well, Scala and Swift, they're similar in many regards, actually, uh, which, is, uh, which is very refreshing. I think they're both modern and uh, clean languages and uh, that are a joy to work with. Uh, they, they, they have different aspects. So Swift is really good at compiling down to native code, which is amazing. You can just take your code and uh, compile to whatever. And the, the, this project, uh, Swift MLIR, right, it exploits this, uh, this possibility. Whereas in Scala, that would be a, a tougher sell, right? Scala is pretty tied to the JVM. So how do you involve JVM bytecode or translate it? So th there are open questions. On the other hand, as I mentioned, Scala has uh, more powerful type level features, which is sometimes good, sometimes bad. Uh, so, but, but I think uh, they, uh, both languages are very forward looking and uh, they contribute to the entire programming languages community very much. So in that sense, uh, both are great. All right, the question is, uh, what's the difference between uh, uh, JVM and native languages that just you know, jumped at me when I made the switch? Let's see, startup times. I think that's uh, absolutely amazing. You just compile your program and it, it runs. <laughs> and you, you can compile it again and run again while the JVM is still warming up. <laughs> yeah. This, but, uh, but we are trying really hard in the Swift compiler to close, to, to solve that problem and make it a bit more competitive. <laughs> yeah, and also, uh, you know, uh, to the question whether I miss Scala, I do not miss Nailgun for sure. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's a painful experience. And, you know, in, in that sense, if we reflect on the startup time, I think uh, it's really impressive uh, what Dennis Shabalin and his contributors did in Scala Native. So it's, uh, it's so amazing that you can actually have uh, that stuff that I described in, in Scala. Uh, that's, a, that's a technological marvel, I would say. Yeah, I, I think the difference is really more about a language with a lot of runtime and garbage collection and a language which, at least in theory, has not so much runtime. I mean, you're, you're not going to find anywhere close as uh, much of a runtime in uh, probably any other language than, than JVM-based languages. So implementing a garbage collector on GPU or in TPU, I think that's, that's too crazy even for someone who implemented SQL on GPU. So that, that has to come for something. Sounds like a good uh, April 1st announcement to implement a garbage collector on GPU. I, I, uh, <laughs> this was actually a research topic in 2010. <laughs> Hopefully people have given up on it, but you know. <laughs> Sorry? Uh, garbage collection on uh, GPUs, accelerated garbage collection <laughs> on GPUs. There, there are some papers, and there are some papers on JavaScript on GPUs, but we are ah. going too far into the woods, so I'm not going to mention those. What about physical, Java physical? Ah, uh, disavow. <laughs> disavow. <laughs> yeah, uh, I don't know. Uh, those have been tried in the past, the Jav, Jazel, was that a thing back then in ARM? Or, yeah, I think there was, a, there was some sort of a hardware virtual machine. 
I don't know. I'm, I haven't studied it enough. Take this one. MLR is supposed to be more expressive than LLVM IR. So whatever you can express in LLVM, you should be able to express with the standard dialect of MLR. At least that's my understanding, and I don't think we have a good reason to arbitrarily limit what it can represent. So the answer is that it probably would be possible. Any other 